So the other day I was on eBay and I noticed how wonderfully inexpensive secondhand computer components are right now. So I thought to myself, what is the cheapest gaming PC that we could build? Something that is easy for others to replicate. And now, a few days later, I have a $164 gaming computer that plays Cyberpunk. Yeah, I'm gonna pause you right there. So this is what I wish would have happened, but as of recording this, none of that is true, and I'm in the hole about $700. <laughs> so this is the part of PC gaming, ultra budget PC gaming, that I want to discuss a little bit more. Sometimes things just don't work on your first try, but there's still hope that we can make it right. So this all started about a week ago when I was looking for a video card upgrade on eBay, but was quickly distracted by this magnificent beauty, the Dell Optiplex 7040. And I don't think you guys understand how excited I was to see this. This is a modern pre-built PC at a super cheap price. And the beauty of pre-builds is that you can make some minimal upgrades and turn it into the behemoth epic gaming machine at a super humble price. So I ordered it and some parts to upgrade. Uh, I'm leaning over like crazy. Anyway, it has an i7-6700, which lands somewhere between first and second generation Ryzen in terms of performance. It also comes with eight gigs of RAM, a case obviously, a motherboard, a 240 watt power supply, and the entire computer, $67. Yeah, it's... It's good. And all the necessary upgrades to turn it into the gaming computer that I know is in there. Super affordable and simple as well. Like eight gigs of RAM was only $19 after shipping and tax. And I got a 512 gig SSD M.2 for only $25. And all that's left to complete this cheap computer project is the video card. And I couldn't decide on one. <laughs> So I got a little trigger happy. Because there's so many different routes that you can take with your video card, I decided to split this up into three different tiers. Our entry level tier uses the RX 462 gig for $39. Now two gigs of VRAM would make some people scream, but I was willing to take the risk because it was so cheap and could run on our measly 240 watt power supply. Our mid-tier option uses the GTX 1650 Super 4 gig for $103. It's a big jump in price, but when accounting for power supply requirements, it made more sense than a cheaper GTX 1060 or a similarly priced GTX 1070. All it requires is a $3 SATA to six pin power adapter and you're basically good to go. And lastly, our epic gaming behemoth tier uses the RX 5700. I picked this up because it was so cheap, only $99 before shipping. It's essentially an RTX 2060 with worse ray tracing, but also significantly cheaper. But to make sure that we also don't burn down my bedroom, I ordered a 450 watt power supply for $43. Because of our case size, it had to be small form factor or SFX, and this was the most affordable option that worked. It's so cute. With shipping, we spent about 400 $136 for three different gaming computer configurations. If we break down the price of each individual computer tier, then we see that they all sit under $300, which is extremely exciting. After the parts arrived, I got started as soon as I could on the entry level or RX 460 option. Because I've done this like a million times, I installed my upgrades like right away the RAM, the SSD, and the video card. Now, if you've done this before, you know that this is an awful idea. You always, always, always want to test the computer before you modify anything. But after removing all of my upgrades, clearing the CMOS battery, and then using integrated graphics, I was actually able to boot and get Windows 10 installed. So at this point, I'm sitting here like, now I'm really in the clear. No. Not at all. Look what happens when I try to install the RX 460. The power supply makes this ticking time bomb sound effect and the system completely shuts off. And no BIOS update or tinkering could fix this boot error or the despair that I'm feeling in my heart at the moment. So I did some hardware tinkering instead. So I know that some pre-built computers actually limit the PCIe slot, the physical place where the video card is installed to just 35 watts. Now the RX 460 that I have is a 75 watt card, even if it doesn't require any external power. 
So that is a potential reason why it's not working. My initial method to confirm this was to test an RX 460 or 560 that required external power. If the PCIe slot can only provide 35 watts, the power supply can directly provide the remaining 40 watts to power the card. If this worked, it meant that my current RX 460 could not work, but other models that required external power could. So I ordered two different RX 560s for about $50 each. And within a day, I realized how completely overkill this methodology is because a crummy 19 watt GT710 would have proved the exact same thing and would have cost me pennies. <sighs> More money down the drain, I know. Luckily, this computer came with the AMD Fire Pro W2100, some kind of video card, but its TDP is 26 watts. So, if this is the problem, then this theoretically should work. Let's see. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> At this point, I was a few days into this cheapest viable gaming PC project. I've spent $536 and morale is low. And to add insult to injury, I discovered A, my power adapter for the 1650 was lost in shipping and I accidentally replaced it with a dual SATA to six pin adapter. It draws too much power, so the PC refuses to even turn on. And secondly, my RX 5700 literally does not fit in my case and my power supply only kind of fits in my case. <gasps> so how was I doing at this point? Phenomenal. Everything was fine. Everything was fine. The silver lining was I had reason to believe that the power supply was bad. And thankfully, a power supply replacement was about $15 to $20 through eBay. Unfortunately, I did not have the luxury of time, so I ordered two different power supplies, about $39 and $67 respectively, through Amazon. I bought two because at this point in time I had very clear trust issues and I just wanted the computer to work. The project has now consumed a total of $642 and I have nothing to show for it. So hopefully these power supplies fix something. So after making sure that the power supply worked without any PC modifications, I crossed my fingers and installed the RX 460 and nothing, the computer turned off yet again. This time there wasn't a ticking sound from the power supply, which was good, but when I tried to turn the computer back on, I noticed something really weird about the power button. When I pushed it, I wasn't getting a click, so I reached into the front panel to push the switch itself. And y'all, I wish my audio wasn't lost because I felt insane relief and insane stupidity all at the same time. So I don't think the issue was the power supply at all. I really don't think there was an issue. The button was just loose and it's only loose when the case is open. When it's closed, it works fine. So after years of building dozens of computers, I still miss the obvious solutions. That's just the life of IT and PC building. At least it keeps you humble. About two weeks and almost $700 later, we finally have a computer that boots. A lot has happened, so let's recap. The base computer was a $67 Optiplex 7040 with an i7-6700, 8 gigs of DDR4 RAM, and a 240 watt power supply. We added 8 more gigs of RAM for $19 and a 512 gig NVMe SSD for $25. Our entry level tier uses a $39 RX 460 2 gig and our mid-tier level uses a $103 GTX 1650 Super plus another three-ish dollars for the power adapter. Unfortunately, we couldn't fix the epic behemoth gaming computer model tier, but maybe another time. So total with shipping for the entry-level model was $168 approximately, and then total for the mid-tier level one was about $240. And finally, testing let's see how this computer performs yeah so i personally think that 1080p 60 fps for esport titles and 1080p 30 fps for triple a single player games is what i would consider playable the entry level machine with the rx 460 did satisfy this requirement 
but you definitely have to work around the two gigs of VRAM. Rainbow Six Siege using Vulkan is a great example. Performance was oddly abysmal, especially since I expect Vulkan to give the best numbers on average. Fortunately, DirectX 11 worked great and the computer pulled its weight. Hogwarts Legacy and Cyberpunk are two games where you need to spend time fine tuning the settings and figuring out what you're willing to sacrifice. FSR completely saves the day here, but it did have some cute little silly goofy artifacts sparsed in there. I mean, look at Alex Poop Snapper's head. It shouldn't look like this. But hey, at the end of the day, it did run the games and that is more than I could expect from a card of this caliber. Civilization was totally fine on this card and you won't have any problems. It's a boring story, but after the month that I've had with this computer, boring sounds really, really, really good. New World and MMO was surprisingly good. The textures took a few moments to load in after updating settings, but afterwards it was totally fine in some mild combat. This is with dynamic scaling resolution off, so you can still squeeze out just a little bit more performance. The mid-tier PC played all of the games phenomenally, so you don't have to worry about anything there. I'm also happy with the entry-level $168 model, but the VRAM is a severe limiter. The worst part is I don't think that there is an alternative to this video card, one that is this cheap has this kind of performance, and is just plug and play. If there is, let me know, but this might be our best bet. After spending almost a month on this computer, I'm happy that it's working, but I've decided to take things a step further. I'm actually going to replace my RTX 3080 computer with one of these ultra uber cheap computers. And you guys are gonna choose which one for me. And I've actually already started this. It's only been a couple of days and I've been experimenting a little bit, but there's a short teaser trailer already up on my streaming platform, Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by creators so people like myself and my friends can just make good content without worrying about click-through rates or titles or thumbnails or other potential distractions. You as a viewer directly support me and my friends through your subscription and we return the favor by giving you fun content, like my masochist adoption of one of these really cheap computers. But your Nebula subscription also gives you other things, like classes. Graham Harther has a whole course on how to enrich your video through healthier audio. And then there's also original content. My friend Adam, who you guys might know as Epos Fox, has a whole original docu-series on retro hardware. If you're interested, Nebula is actually offering a lifetime membership for those who use the link in my description, which is crazy to think about. Most things don't last forever nowadays, but I know that won't work for everyone. So if you just want to try out Nebula, there's a link for 40% off in annual description, and it totals to about $2.50 a month. So to my current Nebula subscribers, thank you. To the future ones, welcome, and also thank you. Whew. Well, this process has taught me a lot. I mean, I've had to do the video multiple times. One thing is that I'm a little too trigger happy and I should more thoughtfully consider my computer projects and problems before just throwing money at it. I also really want to try to get the Epic Behemoth Gaming PC model actually working. I think there's something really cool there. If you're interested in that, then leave a smiley face in the comments and I'll get started on that. And for those watching on Nebula, thank you so much. I think that's it. So until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace.